Half in the bag. Fuck movies. So, Jay, how's your sex life? Oh, uh, you know, I finally got around to trying one of those fleshlights. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Oh, thank God. Yes, come in, please. Hey, guys, what's up? Hey, it's Alexander Philippe, the director of People vs. George Lucas. Yes, yeah, so um, my car broke down, and I was just wondering if maybe I could, like, use your phone? Um, sure. Uh, it'll be a dollar. Hey everyone, welcome to Half in the Bag, and we are joined this time by Alexander Philippe, director of The People vs. George Lucas. That's right, Jay. Alexander's gonna hang out with us for a bit and talk about movies and stuff while he waits for a tow truck to pick up his broken down hoopty. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, you know, I, strangely enough, I was driving through Milwaukee and, um, you know, I didn't even know you guys were here. It's crazy. It's a weird coincidence. Yeah, really. The, what should we talk about? Um, politics? Uh, uh, art? Can we talk about scarves? Oh, scarves. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. The, the proper application of scarves. Yeah, yeah. I just watched an amazing video about it. When a woman wears a scarf, she's telling the world, I'm confident, sophisticated, practical, sensational. We can talk about the proper way to, that to, like to fun. fold yeah, scarves. I mean, for anything. Or we could talk about Star Wars, too, you know? It's the what? We could talk about Star Wars. There is something about our love for Star Wars that is different from our love for other things. True Star Wars is not there! Is it here? It's funny that this can make people angry, but it does make you angry. Like, don't you ever say it's just a film. It's not just a film. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the movie? Well, you know, the movie is really, in, in a nutshell, about the dysfunctional relationship between George Lucas and his fans over the past, you know, 30 years. So what, what was your, like, motivation or inspiration for wanting to make this film? Well, you know, I'm, I grew up very much as a Star Wars fan. You know, I was actually raised in Switzerland, in Geneva. And um, uh, my first, actually, theatrical experience was The Empire Strikes Back. When we're in retirement homes, arguing about things, we'll be having a conversation about what went wrong with the fans and menace. If he wants to fix something, go back and redo Howard the Duck. I saw Judge Lucas, I'd give him a big hug and say thank you. I hate even saying things like I just said, because it sounds like I'm being mean to Lucas, and I love him. A lot of people think the, the film is kind of like a George Lucas bashing movie, because it's right. called The People versus George Lucas. Sure. They, don't, they don't see it as... as you present it sort of as like a legal case, sort of just both sides of a, it, an issue. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, that was definitely one of the issues that we faced, I mean, especially early on when people had not even obviously seen our film, is that, you know, they just wouldn't go beyond the title. It's just not, I mean, it's obviously not that, you know, it was really our intent to make a very, very balanced, very objective debate around, around the issue and kind of, Look at it as what it is, which is a very sort of unique cultural dynamic, you know, between a creator and, and his fans. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of hate or frustration from the fans that is being, you know, displayed, I guess, in the film. But also a lot of love and, and affection and, and and admiration towards George. Yeah, it's not it's not a movie that's just like bogged down in Star Wars you know, details, and it's not, it's, it's a bigger, broader movie. Um, it's yeah. a very funny movie. It's very fast paced, very entertaining, and, and it's certainly a movie like Star Wars fans will obviously oh, be very yeah. involved in, but it's a movie that, um, you know, you don't have to have seen Star Wars to enjoy it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've had a lot of actually non-fans or even people who have not seen Star Wars, you know, come up to me after the film and say how much they, they really enjoyed it. Uh, the thing though about the Star Wars fans, is I, I can tell you that literally every screening that I've attended, I have at least one fan coming up to me and say, you know, thanks for this film, it felt like therapy. I mean, how can you not feel bad to have people who love you and worship you as a god like turn against you as if you're some sort of fallen angel? You know, has he fulfilled his destiny or has he destroyed his legacy? I think when you get specialists who are absolute devotees, you're wide open to criticism. The movie's also about um, it deals with issues about like the ownership of, oh, yeah. of the movies and the ownership. Like, does he have the right to 
to make all these changes, or do the movies belong to the fans? Yeah, that's the, I think that's the, really the larger sort of question that is posed by the movie is who does you know Star Wars belong to? And and of course, then it goes beyond Star Wars. It's not just about Star Wars, but it's about in our day and age, you know. Uh, I mean, especially with the internet and YouTube and all that stuff, you know, uh, when when something becomes as popular and uh, as as really important to culture as, as Star Wars does, uh, it's a really fine line. Legally, it's clear. Of course, it belongs to George Lucas, but there's a moral obligation. There's a, you know, I think. I mean, the fact that it's it's been inducted into the um, you know National Film Registry at the Library of Congress. Uh, I mean, that in itself, I think, means something. It means that it belongs to all of us. It belongs to culture. Well, a, a lot of people now are pointing out the 1988 George Lucas oh. speech to Congress yes. when he was, you know, defending the rights not to change or alter motion pictures. Yep. And he's talking specifically about colorizing, right? Wasn't yes. that a big issue? Yeah. It was, and, and, but his statement was broader than that. I mean, it it's was, really about yeah. making sure that the direct, well, first of all, that the director's intent remains what it sure. was. Well, well that's, that's the question right. though, is, is like, I think all of that started when um, Ted Turner was colorizing old movies. And, Absolutely. And, and I assume he had the rights to those movies, or he bought up the rights to right. them. But they're not his movies, he didn't direct them, right. he's not the creator Lucas, of them. Exactly. Um, unquestionably, Lucas owns all the Star Wars movies, yeah. but uh, you know, Richard Marquand and um, Irvin, Kirshner. Irvin Kirshner are the directors, and right. of course both of those men are now dead. Um, and does, even though Lucas owns the rights to the movies, or owns the movies outright, they, it was their artistic vision that, so does he have the right to do that? Legally, yes, but artistically? It's, it's very, yeah, I mean, it's very questionable. I mean, it's, it seems like George Lucas is doing the very things that, you know, he was condemning back in 1988. Sure. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a really sticky issue. But, you know, again, then you go back to this notion of, you know, I think it's, I think it's, okay for George to, to keep changing the movie every time as long as he preserves you know those films that affected us yeah. so much in the first that's, place. That's the, the sticking point for a it's, lot of people is that not, he's holding those back. Yeah. yeah it's not too much to ask I mean it really isn't I mean every classic film I think deserves that much yeah you know and the one classic film that we don't have is Star Wars I mean makes no sense. Well, we have some copies of Star Wars. Oh, yeah, on VHS. That's funny you bring that but up. But check yeah. this out. Yeah, this is a, this is cool stuff, actually. This is this is something I purchased in 1995. Um, little did I know I, that it would become you know the only existing copy of Star Wars. But yeah, this these are the original versions widescreen before they were yeah. the special editions. And George Lucas even makes a veiled threat on the back <laughs> where he says. Um, you know, he calls it the final video release. The of final Star video release in its original, in its original version. version. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 1995. So. That's you know, I, I had never seen that box before. That's <laughs> that's pretty special stuff. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, these are the laser discs. Uh, we're missing Jedi, of course. But, yeah. Uh, these, however, are not anamorphic. No, they're four by three letterboxed, which is what he ported over for one of the DVD releases as a bonus feature. The original movie is a bonus feature. Basically. <laughs> that's so bizarre to me. Well, yeah, that's the end of that. Well, which, which artwork do you think is better? Um, this is the Laserdisc version. This or the... the... How can you not love that? That's great stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, this is clearly better. Yeah. That one's clearly better is what you mean, oh, right? Because it's like, you look at it and you're like, that's the guy from Star Wars. Yeah. I recognize that. Yeah. This, there's too much shit happening everywhere. George Lucas let one of his daughters play with Photoshop. Aww. Well, it's interesting how the, the artwork has just devolved over time. Yeah. Well, it's even worse now with the, uh, the Blu-ray box set where the entire focus, uh, what they decided to, to you know, encapsulate the entire Star Wars saga is Jake Lloyd. <laughs> And then speaking of the Blu-rays, of course, that's the big controversy going well, around now is the... more changes, more pointless changes. It's, it's like you expect it. Yeah, and it, at this it point, comes. it's when the, the no came out, when there was clips leaked online that that was going to be on there. Uh, I thought it could be phony, but I also wouldn't have doubted if it was real. Like, I can see that. Uh, Lucasfilm came forward right away and said, uh, no, no, mm -hmm. uh, we actually did that. 
I thought it was funny too that they released a press statement that's just like, yep, <laughs> yeah. we did that now. Right. And we're not ashamed of we're it. We're not ashamed they, of they it. They have to release a press statement saying that something's real. At this stage, I kind of feel like every everything that, that happens is part of a game. Well, I mean, that's the question with, with Lucas. I mean, Rich Evans was saying like when the special editions came out in theaters, it was like, hey, neat. Uh, the advertisement for Star Wars was, for years, you were, have been used to seeing Star Wars like this. And I shows a little that, TV yeah. screen that goes, now see it like this. Wow. And it's like, with newly added special effects, it's like, okay, cool. I'm the you know, Like, that's just a little add-on for fun. It was, yeah, it's okay, it's on the big screen now. They've enhanced some things, you know, and, and blah, blah, blah. But, but now it's gotten to the point where uh, George Lucas kind of seems like an obsessive compulsive disorder crazy person. Yeah. Where nothing can be, it can't ever be perfect, can't ever be you perfect. You have to keep like, fixing. I mean, I think it could be that, or I think at this stage, I, I, I'm not ruling out the possibility that he's just really toying with his fans. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, if you really look at, at the changes that he's making, I mean, they're so, first of all, they're really minute changes, but they're fairly nonsensical. You yeah. know, I mean, they, they really don't improve the movie. I mean, in any sort of substantial way. In fact, I think we can really make an argument that they make, you know, they just keep making them worse. You know? Yeah, well, um, some of the stuff comes off like, like little things that may have always bothered him. Like, like, like a, a perfect, a person with a perfectly clean house, like seeing just a spot and going, sure. trying to get it out. Like the Ewok's eyes blinking. Yeah. Like, that may have bugged him. Yeah, but you know, but if that's true, then why didn't he do it ten years ten years ago? You know what I mean, yeah. or or five years ago, or, yeah, yeah. or I mean, it's 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 just like it's always going to be something. I mean, I guarantee you. Yeah. When the Star Wars three D move, you know, three D comes out, it's going to happen again. From a Lucas perspective, I would assume it's a cost thing. I always look at the money. I always look at the bottom line. It, perhaps all those things did bother him at the time, but having massive amounts of changes would have cost X amount of dollars. So he's spacing it out over years and years yeah. and years. It's some sort of gigantic plan of some kind. But <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't know that, yeah. While fixing the Ewoks blinking or some sort of technical thing, he seems to make changes to the movies where he completely doesn't understand the character. That scene yeah. with Jabba was a totally different Jabba. Han, my boy, I'm only doing this because you're the best and because I need you. And then putting that the CGI Jabba saying those things and then seeing him in Jedi, it's like two completely different characters. You think I had a choice? Well, then it's also things where he'll change it and then change it back, like in Empire when... Oh, that's the worst. That's, yeah, in Empire for the special edition, Luke finds out Vader's his father, he jumps down, and for the special edition, they added him going, ah, which completely changed, like... Do you remember he, that? Yeah. It was yeah. just in the theater version only. And then the DVD, well, it was on the VHS special editions too, I believe. Oh, it was. But then when they re-released it on DVD, he took that out. So it's not just that he's making changes that he thinks will improve the movie, he's changing his mind, yes. going back and yes. changing the changes. Well, same with, with Han Solo Greedo, right? I yeah, mean, it's, every time it's, he releases it, that's different. I mean, the last time they were actually kind of shooting at the same time. Mm -hmm. right. right. So... But, but the Luke oh, thing, it's like, I, I could see him thinking going, oh, he's falling and he's not making any noise, that's weird. But the whole point of the scene was that Luke, you know, he's, he's the rebel, he's the ultimate rebel, and he, he just says no, you know, Vader's like, join me or die. And he's like, you know what, I'm- I'd rather die. I'm done, Boom. I'd rather yeah. die. And it was sort of like a self-sacrifice. It, yeah. it was like a, a suicidal kind of thing, you know, just, he's yep. just like, okay, I'm yep. just going to give up. And then, and then they cut to him, he goes, ah! <laughs> It just shows that he doesn't know what's happening in the scene. Yeah. yeah. Or what the character is. It's amazing. Or doesn't care what's really happening in the scene. Right. Yeah. 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 When he's thinking about that specific bit, but not in the context of the overall movie. Like... So what you're saying is George Lucas has a limited mental focus, a limited intelligence. Uh... This beer is good. Oh. It's like the, the job of the, job of the hut palace scene where he changed the musical number to like this upbeat kind of like pop yeah. rock song. Uh, and now, now you're really hitting my, my buttons, <laughs> right? Jabba's Cause... palace is a dingy, dark, depressing place yeah. and you can't have like, yeah, me too, yeah. too, 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 and it's 
But but you know the thing the thing that really bugs me about this particular scene is you know they spent I think reportedly like a million dollars to just to create that little you know Jedi rocks scene. <laughs> Uh, uh, but but the thing that bugs me, if you look at it, is is the very first shot of it, right before the song starts. You see size noodles in the background, and, and it's the real size noodles that we've that we've seen, you know, as kids. And she has the feather, mm -hmm. and then we, you cut away, and then the start, song starts, and you cut to her, and she, you know, she she enters, and it's the CGI size noodles without a feather. And I'm like, so this, you know, you spend a million dollars. All that money. Right, all that money on that scene, and you don't even, like this glaring continuity mistake, <laughs> is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But they did you have know. the little guy, and he, and he screamed into oh, the camera, yeah. and then you saw his, you saw his tonsils. His tonsils, uh, that was amazing. <laughs> well, well, George Lucas has always said, I mean, he's admitted he's not a very good director, mm -hmm. right? Why, do, why did he feel the need to write and direct all three of the prequel films? This kind of goes into the, the subject of, of what's wrong with his brain. Well, although, I mean, I think if you, I mean, again, if you look at, you know, I mean, you look at graffiti and THX and, I mean, the original Star Wars, I thought they were, I mean, they were pretty well-directed films, you know? They're well-edited films. <laughs> yes, they're well-edited films, I, sure. I think, but... Well, well that's, yeah, yeah, there's a lot so, of talk about, about Star Wars and how it was sort of saved and edited yeah. and everything they changed, but right. but you do look at something like American Graffiti and THX 1138, and those are both really well-made movies. I, I think so, I think so. I mean, I think there's real, I think there's real talent in George. I think there was. I, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to side with him there. I, I think there's real talent. Where has that talent gone? That's a whole other question. Yeah. I don't know, I... I, but, I I recently watched THX 1138 for the first time. I had seen his student film okay. um, version of that when I was in college, and um, I don't know, uh, I was not horribly impressed. I, I, I think he had a lot of good talent uh, actor-wise, sure. and, and those performances in THX were really great, but, and I don't know, I just wasn't impressed. And I did not like American Graffiti. Ah, <laughs> wow, well, there you and, go. Like, I, I was just oh. horribly bored during American Graffiti and it felt very flat mm. and very like, it didn't, it didn't have like character to it. It just felt like, it felt like a George Lucas directed film. Like, like, <laughs> like people say the original cut of Star Wars was very like, like not paced out well. Yeah. It didn't have yeah. a lot of like oomph to it. And then those guys went and edited it and they're like, yes, okay, we have to make these scenes work. We have to, so I, I, I propose he's fraud from the, the get-go. From the very beginning, huh? The luckiest man in show business other than Ringo Starr. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't agree with you. I mean, I'll agree on, the, on Ringo Starr, yes, but, okay. but not on George Lucas. <laughs> but I mean, George, I mean, George, I think, has a, has a certain, obviously he has a genius for creating stuff that is going to resonate, like, massively in culture. I mean, it's not just Star Wars. I mean, he, he's done it, you know. Like Howard the Duck? Well, there's Indiana Jones. I mean, come on, you know, it's like, that's it's something. Yes. You know? I mean. I don't know. What would be a third thing? I mean, do we need a third thing, though? Yes, I mean, scientifically. Two, two <laughs> times is a coincidence. Three okay. times equals a pattern. So, you know, old, old well, sci-fi I mean, think... serials like Flash Gordon and stuff. Hey, let's do that. Oh, how about old adventure serials and then after that there was nothing for 25 I, years i i can well hit. sure but i can t i mean i think i think the third though even though it's not as evident now radio land murders no no it's it's gra graffiti american graffiti resonated big time when it came out i mean it really totally shocked the studios sure um, well that was at a, a, so. a certain point in history when the studio system was dying yeah. and younger filmmakers were, were coming up. Sure. But in hindsight, that movie isn't like a, still a cultural phenomenon like Star Wars and Indiana Jones are. It's sort of like, oh, that was George Lucas' no, first sure. movie. Sure. Um, and we give it respect for sure. what it was, but. But where, where I was going with this is that I think he, you know, he obviously creates those amazing things, mm -hmm. but also I think he fails to understand what it is about those. Sure. That, well, that we like so absolutely. much. Yeah. Well, I, I think we'll all agree that George Lucas is a, a very good idea man. But, yeah, yeah. But, but, but the big question is then, by 1999, did he not realize that that was his thing? 
uh, being a producer, executive producer, uh, controller, as opposed to an artist. Well, he's acknowledged that, though, that he's not a good writer, that he's not a good director, so why unless he's, there's that tick in his brain, like, well, I want to be known for this. I created yeah. Star Wars. I'm going to make these movies, even though he's aware of the fact that he's not a very talented writer. Well, I mean, so, obviously, there's a desire to, to prove himself, I think. Yeah. Obviously, there's a love of movies, of making films, yeah. you know? Is that, what, like, a desire to prove to himself that, that he's making films of value? Maybe. I don't know. Well, that, yeah, yeah, that's the big question, is, is, is was him wanting to write and direct and completely control the, the new prequel films, some sort of narcissistic ego maniac kind of like, I'm the guy yeah. that did these. I See, have I think it goes them. deeper than that. I think it's like when, when Star Wars became, you know, Star Wars, right? And, and you wake up, right? I mean, I can only imagine you're George Lucas, you wake up and, and basically you're like, oh, I'm the father, I'm the creator of this thing, yeah. right? That's become so huge. I mean, isn't there like a sense of responsibility? Isn't there a sense of responsibility at some point where you just feel like you have to, you're the one who has to just yeah, yeah. continue this? Well, this, he does talk about it sometimes like it's a burden at this point. Oh, totally. Yeah, once I'm done with these Star Wars movies, I'll make my personal films, but he's never gonna be done with Star Wars. George has said many times to me and to many other people that Star Wars was a bit of a curse. He had a pile of scripts that he would show me, he would never let me read them. And he would say, these are the movies I'm going to make. None of those movies have been made. I mean, maybe he wanted to, to give it to somebody else, but just felt like he couldn't. Like he had to, he had to do it. I don't know. Uh, unless it affected him psychologically in, in, in a certain way where no, that's possible for, for 20 years, you know, everyone kissed his ass and said, you're the greatest, George. You created Star Wars. You created Star Wars. And secretly, deep down inside, he knows really didn't do all that much. <laughs> he started the ball rolling, you know, and, yeah. and the actors made it work, the editors made it work, the, the art department, I mean, made it work. And he had the ideas, and then they're like, you created everything, you created everything. And then over time, mm -hmm. that sort of started to eat away at him yeah. to where he felt he had to prove something. I mean, the, I think the prequels do kind of prove that his ultimate decision-making process is horribly flawed. Is just well, it's maybe gotten things. worse, too, over the years, between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, he's a different guy. I mean, you know, so much time passed. I yeah. mean, you, you, now you're this billionaire, and, yeah. and you can do everything you want, and, you've, and your original team is gone. And I mean, I, I, his mind is not in the same, you know, in the same place. Yeah. He's a, a different person, sure, as you, as you grow older, I guess. Yeah. But, and he probably looks at things more from the perspective of selling stuff and kids sure. and how, you know. Sure. And uh, Star Wars, the original Star Wars, is a pretty gritty film in comparison oh, to, man. you know, just oh, all the man. death and violence and murder, and betrayal, and <laughs> they blow up a whole planet of people. <laughs> they do. Darth Vader chokes people. Han Solo murders someone. Luke's family gets burned alive. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, very yeah, I know, I know. You know, a gritty space movie and then, then everything else is, is sort of cartoony crap. And so yeah. It, what are you talking about? Revenge of the Sith is dark. Oh right, it is. Yeah, I, I guess it is a little, sure. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure on George Lucas to make these because it's their business ventures. I don't know what I would do if I met George Lucas in the street. If I'd want to shake his hand or hit him in the stomach. Can you be that mad at a man who made Star Wars? The man made Star Wars. So People versus George Lucas. Um, to give some background, we, we began talking with you a couple, two, three years ago. Yeah, yeah, at least, I mean, I would say almost four. Well, three, probably three and a half years Yeah, ago, we so made yeah. A, a short film called The, uh, the United States of No. Yes. Yes, uh, check it out, check yeah. it out. <laughs> Which uh, featured myself and Rich Evans in a, a mock-up scene, depicting the final scene in episode three. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you were collecting yeah. kind of fan footage and uh -huh. homemade movies and stuff like that for, for the documentary. So it features a lot of uh, internet shorts yeah. and homemade, uh, fan-made stuff. A ton. How long? I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do, do you guys smell something? Yeah, you mean like cat piss and Bengay? No, no, it's like like flannel and B.O. Yeah, I smell that flannel shirt. Weird. Yeah, maybe. 
Yeah. Well, well. Anyway, um, yeah. a, a question I think a lot of people have in regards mm. to the movie is: Has George Lucas seen it? Well, you know, um, I, I certainly have not seen him in the audience yet. You know, now the DVD is obviously going to be released pretty soon, and and you know, people are going to get a chance to see it, and that includes George. You know, if he wants to. Um, I've always said, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to give him a, a private screening at, at the ranch or, you know, wherever. I, I really don't think he's going to give me a call, but, uh, I, you know, I, I do hope he gets to see it. I hope he's at least a little bit curious about it, and, and I hope he watches it from beginning to end because, uh, you know, hopefully he'll realize it's actually a very, um, it's a loving film. George Lucas raped a childhood. George Lucas, who was a small child, came to the king. Well, well. Speaking of screenings, it, it seems like you had sort of a long screening process, festival process. Oh, how, God. Yeah. How long has the movie's coming out on DVD soon? But how long was it of going to festivals and screening it? It's still happening. And it is still happening. It's still being screened. It's still places. happening. Wow. It was amazing. Like right at the time of our South by Southwest premiere, um, I mean, we got, I mean, invitations every day. Uh, when was that premiere? That was March 2010. Okay. So we're talking like a year and a half ago, you yeah. know. And uh, so it was a combination of, you know, big international fasts, uh, documentary film festivals, and then genre film festivals. And uh, we went with the Chicago Comic Con. Uh, we, we eventually decided not to go with uh, you know, screenings at, at San Diego or other other cons we were panels. At the Chicago Chicago yeah, we were at that one. Yeah, yeah. You had your your one one three eight bracelet. I did. I did. Yes. Yes. That was a one one three eight bracelet. My my com. Uh, while I was sitting there during the Q and A after the movie, yeah. I looked down at my the Wizard World bracelet, and the the ID number was one one three eight. Oh, really? And I was like, that's weird. That's an odd coincidence. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, in addition to the festivals and a couple of the screenings, there's a small theatrical run of the movie? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, it was uh, selected cities, essentially. Um, I mean, I think there, you know, there was Los Angeles, of course, New York, uh, Denver, um, and, you know, there was Chicago. Uh, and it, I mean, I think, obviously, you guys were there, right? Yeah. Yes, Chicago. yes. We, uh, we actually attended the Chicago screening of the movie, and uh, we brought along our trusty video camera. Hi everybody, we're here for the Chicago premiere of The People vs. George Lucas. Behind me is the famous Chicago Theater. The movie's not playing in there, but it, it's behind me. The movie's actually playing across the street at the Gene Siskel Film Center. Let's go inside and check it out. Here at the Gene Siskel Film Center, they have a great collection of photographs of some of the legends of the silver screen. Here we have Judy Garland, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, James Dean, the man himself, Alfred Hitchcock, legend, true legendary director, Marilyn Monroe. Oh, oh, that's, um, that's Gary Cooper. There's uh, Greta Garbo and... Uh, and Jar Jar Binks, a true legend of the silver screen. Um, why is that in this collection? Alexander's a huge Star Wars fan. He's a collector. He wanted to create a film that he could sit on a couch next to George Lucas and watch it with him and, and feel proud of what he put out there. And I think he accomplished that. Oh. So you guys just saw The People vs. George Lucas, what'd you think? I, it was pretty good, I, I really got to know the man, I, I feel confident I could spot him should he 
ever show up anywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's very obvious, you know. I would think so. He sticks out like a sore thumb in a public setting, really. What do you think about the movie? Well, I thought it was quite a lot of fun. Um, if you could make a special edition of George Lucas himself, what would you change? He would shoot first. Oh. <laughs> he would definitely shoot first. Continued in part two.